Welcome again to another episode of the Prophecy Pros podcast. Uh, as always, we want to thank Harvest House Publishers for sponsoring this and helping us get this out in front of everybody. Uh, again, you, if you want some really solid resources, go to harvestprophecyhq.com. Amazing stuff there. You don't want to miss. Um, but this is kind of the last um, episode, not of the season, but the last episode in this series of emotions that we've been talking about. And we kind of saved this one for, for last because it's pretty heavy in terms of where people are today. And it's, we're talking about hope. And to be honest, what we see out there is there's a great lack of hope uh, in, the, in the Christian world and in the secular world. People are scared, people are hopeless, they don't know what to do. Uh, so hope really is a, is a key, uh, key emotion, and it's deeper than that, which we'll see here uh, from a, from, in terms of a Christian perspective. But people need hope to survive. They cannot get by without it. Um, so many times I've heard of people going through the toughest of things, but if they have hope, a shred of hope, they make it through. And, uh, and Jeff has an amazing quote here. He'll share with you in a minute, but, but what can we, what else can we say about hope and where people are today? Yeah. Well, think about it. The world has no hope. Uh, mm -hmm. the, you look at what's going on in the world. There's, there's no hope for peace in the middle East. Uh, uh, there's no hope for, you know, curing diseases or preventing, you know, the next so-called pandemic that might, might come our way. Mm -hmm. uh, there, you know, people feel no hope politically. Uh, they feel no hope in terms of, you know, people are saying, oh, the world's going to end. And, and, you know, that you've got the bulletin of atomic scientists saying we're, you know, what is it, 90 seconds to midnight kind of thing. Mm -hmm. We're on the verge of an extinction event for humanity. There's no hope. There's no message of hope that the world has out there. Well, Christians are the only people that have that message of hope because we have promise uh, of what God says is going to happen for us. Now, for, for the earth and for people, those who dwell on the earth, it is, which is a phrase that's used over a dozen times in Revelation to refer to unbelievers in the last days, there is no hope for them uh, unless they turn to Christ. Uh, I remember, Todd, uh, years ago when I wrote, uh, as it was in the days of Noah, uh, when the book debuted on that day, I found myself that morning on Fox and Friends, and the movie Noah had come out, and they were asking me all this stuff. And the very last question they asked me was, uh, they said, uh, Jeff, is there any hope? And I just thought to myself in that microsecond, I thought, are they asking me to share the gospel on national TV? Mm. And I just said, you know what? There's nothing but hope for those who know Jesus Christ. He's the ark. He's the door to the ark and the door's open. So as long as the door to the ark is open, there's hope. And as long as there's breath, there's hope. So yeah, the world has no hope, but Christ is the one who offers the hope. I, I love what th this, uh, what someone wrote one time. They said uh, that you can live uh, 40 days uh, without food and water. You can live four minutes without air, but you can't live four seconds without hope. Mm. And so fortunately for us as believers in Christ, uh, we have uh, a great sense uh, of hope, and and we want to give that hope to the world. Uh, but Todd, let's begin just back again. I think it's always healthy uh, to rehearse our salvation, to remember what Christ has done for us. You know, He gave us the Lord's Supper uh, as a memorial to to remember his sacrifice for us. Uh, we don't mourn over it. We celebrate. We celebrate the Lord's Supper. And uh, interesting, you know, Paul said, you know, every time uh, you take the Lord's Supper, you proclaim uh, his death until he returns. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's something we should always do. Uh, but I'm reminded of, of Ephesians chapter two. And, you know, Paul has drawn a contrast here between Gentiles and, and between Jews and how the gospel initially came for the Jews and to the Jews uh, and through the Jews. But he says uh, in verse 12, he says, Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant of promise, and having no hope and without God in the world. Uh, and then those great words in verse 13, but now. But now, uh, pay attention to the butts in the Bible, someone has said, you know, because they're, they're hinges upon which great truth and theology and destiny swings. And so he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near to God by the blood of Christ. So, so Todd, there was a time in each of our lives when we had no hope and we may not have realized how hopeless our situation really was, how bad things really were. Um, but that's what we had to come to in order to, to come to Christ. We had to realize that we didn't have mm -hmm. hope. 
And so when whoever it was that shared the gospel with us, with you, with me, essentially they were helping us understand that not only do we not have hope, but that hope is found only in Jesus Christ. So true. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I think even my, my mindset now compared to before I was a believer and in terms of hope, you know, mm -hmm. is off the charts. And we talk about hope as it's an emotion for sure, mm -hmm. but it's really bibli biblical hope is a guaranteed promise. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not like, Oh, I hope this is going to happen. Yeah. It's this hope in you is a guaranteed future event. Yeah. It's as, like we said in the last episode, it's as good as done. We mm -hmm. can count on it. We can bank on it. So basically the emotional hope comes from the fact of if people are not anchored to a guaranteed future, mm. they don't have that hope. And then it becomes an emotional hopelessness. Yeah. But like you said, Jeff, the fact that those of us who know Christ, uh, we have this hope in us. We have this guaranteed future. We have this promise. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we have something amazing to look forward to and something incredible we were rescued from. So we need to remember that when it comes mm. to hope. And you, you mentioned two short phrases, but now mm -hmm. and until he returns, mm. those are, you know, small in words, but mighty in weight. Yeah. Uh, both of those are in terms of our hope and looking forward. Mm. Uh, we talked about in a, in a previous episode, but I'll read it again. First John three, three. All who have this hope fixed on him mm -hmm. purifies himself mm -hmm. for he is pure. Our hope is fixed or anchored to the person of Jesus Christ yeah. and what he's already accomplished through the death and resurrection and, and ascension and the promised future that he's returning again. Mm. Gosh, that's so true. And, and hope is, is found throughout the entire scriptures. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I'm here in, in Hebrews chapter six. It's talking about, uh, in, in, in verse 11, realizing the full assurance of hope, it says, until the end. Uh, he goes on uh, down in verse, um, in verse 19, or well, verse 18, he says, uh, it says that God who cannot lie uh, gives a strong encouragement uh, for those who have fled to refuge in laying hold of the hope that is set before us. Mm -hmm. And this phrase here just absolutely resonated with me in verse 19. It says, this hope. It's the hope that God will complete our salvation, that mm -hmm. God's going to come true with everything, that God's going to make you like Christ and perfect one day. Listen to this. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, mm. an anchor of the soul. That, that, that phrase right there just so impacted me. And, and I remember when I first read and really kind of grasped the, the truth of this verse, I thought to myself, you know, most anchors are things that are thrown off a, a ship and it anchors you down kind of thing. Our, our anchor is up, mm -hmm. you know, our anchor, right. we're anchored up, not anchored down. Mm -hmm. And, and that hope in heaven that we have waiting for us, uh, the hope of his promises, he says, let's hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us. So the idea of this hope takes us into intimacy with God. It takes us into a relationship with God. And notice that the author's words here, it's sure and it's steadfast, uh, meaning it can absolutely be trusted in uh, and, and be relied upon, but then steadfast means it continues. <laughs> mm. So, so it's not just something that, that is, you know, sure in the past, but it's something that, that is ongoing to the future. And of course, in, in the new Testament, when it speaks of the word hope, it's not the idea of, you know, I hope I get a pony for my birthday kind of thing. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a confident expectation. Mm -hmm. That's very important that we get that scriptural principle into our minds. When we say we hope in Christ, uh, we hope in the rapture, it's a confident expectation. And we've already done an episode on, on confidence, applying that confidence uh, to the expectation uh, of, the, of the soon return of Jesus Christ. So, so Todd, th that hope, uh, again, it, it impacts our soul, it impacts the deepest part of who we are, doesn't it? It really does. And I love that picture of tying hope to the picture of an anchor, you know, mm. think about an anchor, a boat that's anchored. Like you said, we're anchored to the future. We're anchored up, but the connotation of a boat being anchored, it doesn't matter what storm is going that's around. Right. It doesn't matter what the waves are doing, what the wind's doing, how deep the water is. Mm -hmm. 
what the other people on the deck are doing, that boat is anchored and it's not moving. It may sway back and forth. It may go through some things, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's anchored to something. And that's, that's again, going back to our salvation, there's a past present and future tense to our salvation. Mm -hmm. As we're floating around, we're anchored to that. You know, we were saved from the penalty of our sin. Mm -hmm. We're being saved from the power of sin as we become more like Christ. And one day we will literally physically be saved Mm -hmm from the presence of sin in our own bodies as we have a a flesh nature and in the world itself when God creates a new heavens and a new earth. So Mm. that anchor is what holds us steady in the storms of life, in the storms of history. It's a guaranteed future. Again, that hope is not a, like you said, I hope I'm going to get a pony. It's Mm -hmm. my hope is anchored in something that is absolutely guaranteed to happen. Yep. Absolutely. And, and again, you know, it's, it's all this hope. You say, well, how how do we know this is going to happen? Well, really the beginning point of, of our hope is found in obviously the character of God, but as far as uh, in, in history, it's, it's found in the resurrection of Christ because Christ rose from the dead. That means he can come back from heaven to get us right Mm -hmm. as a living savior because Jesus rose from the dead. It means that everything he has said about the future is going to come true because he's a living Christ. Uh, only a living Christ can reign, right? If he's just dead, mm-hmm. like every other religious leader yep. in the history of history, they're all still dead. Only one of them is has been resurrected from the dead. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Paul outlines, he, he details this in great, mm-hmm. just logical form uh, in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, he says, mm-hmm. he talks about if Christ has not been raised, and raised then your preaching is in vain. Uh, your faith is in vain, meaning it's empty, empty. He says, then we're false witnesses. We're liars about all the things about God. Uh, he says, because we witness that, that he actually raised from the, Jesus was raised from the dead. But he says, if, if the dead are not raised, uh, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ hasn't been raised, then your faith is worthless. It means it's like counterfeit money. Uh, and you're still in your sins. You haven't been forgiven of your sins. Um, and we obviously know that's not true, but but it says, and then those who have fallen asleep in Christ, they're just dead. You're never going to see them again. Uh, but it says this in verse 19, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Mm. In other words, if you just hoped in a savior and, and nothing happened to him, he, he died and he's just gone. And that's what you're putting your hope in. Then people should really look down on you and pity you. And, you know, it's interesting because by, by, you know, inference, Paul is saying it's the other guys that need to be pitied. It's those who are hoping in good works or hoping in a false religion or hoping in some, uh, some, uh, inner self development, you know, or trying to achieve a certain level of consciousness and peace and love or whatever it might be. Those are people to be pitied. Those are people mm-hmm. that are that have been deduped and deceived and deluded uh, by false religion. And then he just goes on to just talk about uh, because Christ has been raised, all the, all those things are opposite. You know, it's like yeah, our faith is not worthless. It's worth something. We're not in our sins. We're forgiven of our sins. So all of this future hope, Todd, begins at, to be anchored historically in the resurrection of Christ himself. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That was foundational. That, Mm -hmm. that won everything right there. Mm. uh, Even though we have to let the rest play out. And speaking of that, there are, there are several things in the future that we look forward to with hope that are guaranteed because of the resurrection, the the Mm -hmm. guarantee that these things were going to happen when he beat death, Mm. all the rest of the things are guaranteed. And one of those Mm. we read about in, um, Titus 2.13, looking Mm. for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We believe Mm. that's talking about the rapture, uh, and it's kind of a two-part return, so to speak. Even the Greek structure there, from what I understand, kind of highlights the fact that it's one thing with two parts, beginning with the blessed hope. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, so we have an amazing thing to look forward to in the rapture. Absolutely. And and it is the next prophetic event uh, on God's calendar. And if you think about it, hope is is a great motivator. Uh, hope is something that, uh, that if it's anchored in the right thing, it never dies. Mm. And so that's why it's important for us to continually, 
I use this word often, but just to calibrate our mind, to, to sync our mind, uh, put it in sync. It's like, you know, you're, if you got an Apple watch, your Apple watch syncs to your Apple phone that syncs to your Apple computer, it's all saying <laughs> the same thing. You know, well, our minds need to say the same thing that God is saying. Uh, we need to sync our minds with God's word. And we do that by allowing the word to transform our minds daily mm-hmm. and, and to wash all the gunk off that's kind of accumulated, you know, in life. And that we get a fresh start every day because mm. Lamentation says his mercies are new every morning, you know. So every day is a great opportunity. But but based on what you just said and what you just read from Titus 2.13, we look forward to this, to this next event on God's calendar. You say, what's next? Well, the rapture's next. Mm-hmm. That's the next thing that's going to happen. And there's a whole list of verses. And I list uh, some two dozen verses uh, in my book, Wake the Bride, on uh, how we can know that, that the early church, since this hope, and looked forward to this hope. Uh, we won't obviously uh, look at all of them there, Todd, but you know, one of them, 1 Corinthians 1, 7 says, awaiting eagerly the revelation uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this gives us uh, an evidence that the early church had an eagerness. Think about that, an eagerness about about looking forward to what's going to happen, and they were prepared for it. Uh, I remember as a young, uh, as a young boy growing up in my early teens, it's like I played baseball and basketball, uh, and I would get ready like two hours before every game and go to the field or go to the gym, and I would just sit in the stands and I would just get. I was so eager to get mm-hmm. out there and to play. It, it's that kind of looking forward to something that God wants us to have. Uh, we, we talked about the word Maranatha in First Corinthians sixteen twenty two. Uh, it means, oh, Lord, come. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just a please, God, please come. Uh, it, we're looking forward to this. And, and you know, we think that that's how the early church basically greeted one another and said goodbye to each other uh, each time. Uh, it says, we Philippians 3.20, uh, heaven from which we also eagerly await a savior. So the idea of waiting and hoping, and there's more we can talk about, but, but Todd, it, there's a spirit of anticipation. Mm. Uh, it's, it's, it's looking forward to Christmas morning times a million, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. <laughs> and, and again, that's a strong, uh, proof or mm-hmm. evidence proof text for the mm-hmm. pre-trip rapture. Yeah. The, the only, the only logical way we can expect the Lord return to return at any moment and to us be, to be looking forward to, him appearing is with a, if that has to happen before the tribulation period, yeah. there's nothing else we have to wait for. So that's, that give that, I, that in itself gives us great hope that the next event on the horizon mm-hmm. is the return of the Lord to, yeah. to end the church age and to bring his bride home. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. something we should look forward to. We need to remember it is a marriage wedding ceremony motif that we should be anticipating that. And mm-hmm that the Lord is just as excited to come and mm-hmm. get us when mm-hmm. the father says the time is right. Mm-hmm. That, that we forget that aspect of it sometimes that he's, he's probably more excited to come get us than we are to go be with him. Yeah. Uh, and that speaks to his love and his mm-hmm. grace and the fact that he can't wait. He's anticipating it just yeah. as we are. Right. And that should increase our hope and help us to know that it's a guaranteed thing that's going to happen because it's something that God wants. Yes. And you, when you consider the whole uh, Jewish wedding motif uh, and the imagery there that Christ uses in John 14, think about who was more excited for the wedding. Was it the bride or was it the groom? Well, certainly there's excitement and anticipation for, on both parts. Mm-hmm. But guess who's been away building something, you know, preparing a place. Mm. I can't wait to show you what I have waiting for you. What does that do? That creates more hope in us is I can't wait to see what you've been preparing for me and for us. And we forget sometimes, and, and this is a, this is a biblical truth. This is not a, you know, health and wealth and prosperity and name it, claim it kind of thing. But just to understand it's okay to be excited about what God has planned for you. Mm -hmm. He has good things planned for you in the future, uh, particularly as it relates to eternity and the father's house that he's been preparing for the last 2000 years. And so that's why the the New Testament church was encouraged so much, uh, particularly by the Apostle Paul, uh, to have that that spirit of anticipation. Uh, he talks about uh, in uh, again Titus two thirteen, looking for the blessed hope. First uh, Peter, the end of all things is at hand. Fix your hope. First Peter one thirteen says completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
Mm. Take all of your hope chips and put them in the table and (laughs) bet on the rapture. That's what he's saying. You put all the hope that you could ever have and you place it on the fact that you're going to be with Jesus. He's going to come back and get you. Now, you or, you or I may pass away before them. Uh, we're still going to be involved in the rapture because mm-hmm. we're going to be resurrected. And our spirits are going to come back. Uh, First Thess 4.17 says, and so we're still going to be a part of it. But if you're alive and remain, if you get to be a part of that particular portion of this generation that gets to experience the rapture while you're alive, Fix your hope on that. Put a laser beam on that thing. You know, focus in on that thing and aim for it in terms of your expectation and your hope. And then just a couple other verses here. Uh, Todd, uh, Jude 121, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. I mean, goodness gracious, can God say this any more clear? (laughs) No. And he says it over and over again. Again, you mentioned earlier, I think it was last episode that Mm -hmm. when he repeats something, Mm -hmm. he's trying to get our attention. So we need to look at that. And yeah, that's a whole list of verses there Mm -hmm. and many more that you have uh, in that book there that show that the, the early church, first century church was anticipating the Lord to show up at any moment. Mm -hmm. And that caused them to live in a healthy, hopeful way. Um, so that, so we have the rapture, mm. then we look past that mm. then we have the return mm. of Christ revelation 19, yeah. Yeah. uh, again, looking at the symbolism of the church where on right white robes returning with him. So, it, so you can't ignore all the verses throughout yeah. the tribulation period where the church is in heaven. And now we're returning with him again, another strong support for pre-trib rapture, yeah. what we just talked about along with yeah. uh, eminency. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's another beautiful thing. We get to return yeah. with Christ on to white establish horses. the kingdom on white horses. Yes. Yeah. So there's right. at least we know there people ask, are there animals in heaven? Well, we know there's horses in heaven. Yep. <laughs> the lion will lie down, you know, with, with the, with the lamb and yep. uh, the child will put his hand in the, in the scorpion's den or the, the uh, snake's den and won't get bitten. So there there's the animal kingdom is going to be restored. Uh, during that time. But yeah, mm-hmm. coming back with Christ. Now think about this, that return at the second coming is also a return of great joy and great triumph. Mm-hmm. And after we are raptured, we go to heaven, we receive our rewards at the Bema seat of Christ. Uh, we uh, e- experience the wedding of the lamb. Uh, so we are, our, our, our relationship with Christ is made complete at that moment. Uh, I believe we start experiencing the marriage supper of the lamb uh, at that time. So we're celebrating, there's joy, we're looking forward to that event. Uh, but that's not the, that's not the end. Uh, mm-hmm. At some point Christ says, all right, now it's time, the end of that seven years, it's time to, to be given your horse and you follow me on, on this uh, journey back down. And in scripture, we know that uh, with us will be the angels, uh, with us will be the Old Testament saints, uh, those tribulation saints that have been martyred will be with us as well. We're all going to be on those white horses uh, returning with Jesus. And he's the only one that, that has a weapon. It's the, the sword of the spirit, the word of God that comes out of his mouth. We ride behind mm. him in great triumph, much, much like soldiers would behind a great uh, Roman general. So there's that, Todd, but you know what? It doesn't stop there. Nope. Uh, next thing that happens is we, we get to begin experiencing the millennial kingdom of Christ. Yeah. And that's where we're going to, uh, many uh, Christians are going to be able to rule and reign with Christ in, in various capacities uh, to enjoy Christ in ways that we never have to enjoy the earth. Mm-hmm. Uh, because we're going to, the earth is going to be refurbished for that during that time. Um, and Todd, it's a crazy kind of wild, you know, description that, that scripture gives us of the millennial kingdom, but at the same time, uh, mind blowing. I mean, hashtag mind blown yep. is, is the whole millennial kingdom. Uh, so there's a lot that goes on there and then, and then beyond there, right? Yeah, there really is. And the millennial kingdom itself, you know, it's, it's the front porch to eternity, so mm. to speak, or, mm-hmm. or the, you know, it's going to give us a little taste of everything that's in, in eternity. Uh, and it's, we're told six times in six verses in revelation mm. 20, that it's a thousand year reign. Yeah. So in the old Testament, we're given a lot of information about it, but here we, in uh, chapter 20, we're given the, the duration of it. Then after that, the enemies re- released, uh, released for one final yep. battle, the, the second stand of mm-hmm. Satan, the final stand of Satan, mm-hmm. the second coming of Satan, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's defeated and then God creates a new heavens and a new earth. So it just gets better and better and better. And that new heavens and new earth, uh, the, both of us believe that God doesn't re doesn't create everything new like he did in Genesis one, one, mm-hmm. but that he restores everything. Mm-hmm. He burns the sin out of it, so mm-hmm. to speak. He purifies it and, yeah. and renovates it and, and recreates it 
to be perfect in for all eternity, just like we receive resurrected bodies. Uh, that it, it's, it's our old bodies, but resurrected and glorified. We believe in, in essence, he's going to resurrect the universe in a perfect form mm. and it'll be that way for all of eternity. And I have a book coming out called the nonprofits guide to heaven, where I unpack a lot of the details of what heaven and eternity mm. will be like. And it, I'll tell you, it was a fun ride, mm. uh, researching that and, and looking at other commentaries and reading other books. And, and it's amazing how much is not in scripture about heaven, but what is in scripture about heaven, we can learn a lot and it just gets better and better and better. It really does. And that's the thing as we read in scripture, it says, uh, eye has not seen, uh, nor ear has heard, nor things have even entered the heart of man that God has prepared for those who love him. So if you love Jesus, if you know Jesus, then God is preparing a world for you, an eternity for you, a destiny for you mm. that that is beyond what the collective imagination of mankind from day one could ever come up with because God is an infinite God. He's infinitely creative. Think about that. He's infinitely creative. He infinitely loves you. Uh, and he's infinitely powerful. And so you put all those things together and you're getting a future that uh, is something that's worth looking forward to is something that you hope for. Uh, co again, confident expectation for that. And, and for me, you know, that just tells me that, that God loves us so much, Todd, that he's willing to do that for us. He didn't have to, but he's, in a, in a sense, he's, you know, he made us a little bit lower than the angels, but he's making us, he's exalting us to a position of being one with him in the sense that we're going to know him as we're known. Again, it's, it's so much more than we could possibly describe. Uh, <laughs> but that's why Jesus in Revelation, you know, chapter three, verse 11, he says, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you got. Hang on to what you got. What do you got? You got hope. Mm -hmm. And then in the last chapter of Revelation, Todd, he says this, uh, chapter 22, verse 7, Behold, I am coming quickly. Mm -hmm. 2212, Behold, I am coming quickly. 2220, Yes, I am coming quickly. And that word quickly is a Greek word that just simply means that when it starts happening, it's going to happen. It's like there's no turning back. Once God gives the green light for Christ to come back, He's coming. Nothing's going to stop him. And we know from the signs that are around us today, Todd, that the signs are pointing towards the tribulation period. So that tells us that the rapture, uh, our blessed hope is nearer than we ever thought before. So true. We can take, even, in, even as we see some of the scary things out there, we can take joy in the fact that this is all ha happening as prophesied, that everything is coming together, mm -hmm that our hope is on the near horizon. Mm -hmm. um, prophecy does not happen in a vacuum. It, mm -hmm. um, it, it has some development uh, phases and that's what we see today. Mm -hmm. All of the lines of end time trajectory signs are in play in our day. Uh, and just one practical mm -hmm. verse, uh, actually the whole, this whole chapter is incredibly practical for believers. Romans 12, read the whole mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. But Romans 12, 12, I love it, talking about joy and hope. It says, be joyful in hope, Hmm. patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. There's three action items in one hmm. verse that we can do at this time as we await our blessed hope, as we await our guaranteed future, and as we look forward to the return of Christ. Hmm. Amen. So listen, if you're a believer, you have, as I said before, nothing but hope in your future. Embrace that hope, bathe in it, breathe it, and take it into your life and, and live it out and let others see it in your life uh, to, to share, as First Peter says, the hope that is within you with meekness and gentleness to a world that has no hope. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you guys for watching. Thanks for listening. Uh, we'll see you again next time on the Prophecy Pros podcast. And uh, thanks to Harvest House Publishers for making all this possible. God bless. Take care. <laughs>